and welcome to Film and Game Composers. I'm Mina Shamali, and today I'm speaking to Ian Holtquist and Sophia Holtquist. Uh, they're two composers and musicians based in Los Angeles who recently scored the documentary The First Monday in May, which is set to open the Tribeca Film Festival in April. They've also worked together on scores for the documentary Silicon Cowboys and the comedy drama or dramedy My Blind Brother, starring Jenny Slate, Adam Scott, Zoe Kazan, and Nick Kroll, both of which are showing at the South by Southwest Festival. Now, Ian was a former member of the Inditronica band Passion Pit before moving into full time composing, and Sophia runs the company Drum and Lace, where she focuses on composing bespoke music for fashion campaigns and presentations. Ian and Sophia are also married, if you hadn't guessed by now. Hi, guys. Hello. <laughs> Does that intro kind of uh, uh, do you justice? That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. That, was, that, yeah that was great. <laughs> cool. Well, I, I'm glad. I'm glad. So I wanted to make sure. Because usually the first question people ask on an interview like this is like, so tell us a bit about yourself. Which, which what ends up being, please rephrase your bio uh, for us. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you guys a cocktail party question. How did you guys meet? Yeah, you uh, want to take this? Yeah, uh, we were both attending Berkeley College of Music uh, in the late 2000s, and we were both film scoring majors. And um, I actually worked at the film scoring labs, like signing people in and out. And Sophia was working with my roommate at the time because he was a conductor and he was putting together the, this thing called the Boston Stream Players, which no, was basically like a student ensemble, and they were working on putting the, the first performance at a church in Boston. Um, and I think I came to one of the first meetings that they were at, um, that so Sophie was there. And I had, for some reason, I had an entire pizza that I just sat in the corner eating by myself. <laughs> and I think that was like our first intro, in, official introduction yeah, to each I other. Think, I think I must have mentioned to our, to his roommate and my friend, like, God, who just brings like a pizza, eats it, like doesn't offer any pizza to anyone and then leaves without even helping. But then I must have mentioned something like, oh, you know, but he's kind of cute. And our <laughs> common friend, being the matchmaker that he is, was like, well, he, I think he thinks you're cute. So then I think we took it to MySpace and started MySpace messaging. That's oh how my long God. Ago this was. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, hey, MySpace was good for music back then. So, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to assert that. I'm going to, you know, it was no <laughs> Facebook, but yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah. And then I think from there we we started just kind of dating after that this concert actually happened. Yeah. Because I think that Ian was too shy to to talk to me otherwise. <laughs> so you you, got, you asked him out, I'm suppose I'm guessing. Uh in a I, in a way. <laughs> yeah, she kind of made the first move. <laughs> yeah. That's lovely. That's lovely. Yeah. And now you're married. That's fantastic. We are. <laughs> and Sophia, you actually grew up in my favorite city in the world, Firenze, Florence. Yeah, have That's... you have you spent some time there? Uh, I spent literally two days, and these are two of the best days of my life. Uh, I was on a, I was on a trip to Prato actually because my university had a, a campus in Prato. No way. Uh, yeah. So. That's... Did you study like textiles, or w was it just no, no or music? Like... It was music. Oh, so, well, crazy. That's so cool. <laughs> so you you could take a, a train half hour out of uh, Florence and uh, go to Prato. Yeah. You'll find Monash University, which is where I went. And they have their, okay. like, this uh, little Australian university uh, branch down there. So we, yeah. went, we went there. And then, like, you could take the train up to Florence. And, oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> Why yeah. did you leave? <laughs> well, you know, it's really funny. I feel like, um, so when I was in high school, I was... I wouldn't call myself an angsty teen because I've always been a very like type A um, personality, like very studious, like very like uh, whatever type person. But to counteract that kind of person that I was, I was also like the first kid in my high school to get a tattoo at like 16 and I was full of piercings <laughs> and I, you know, would like go to festivals on my own in like Milano and Rome. And I was kind of, you know, like I always felt like a bit of an outcast because I didn't fit kind of like the the very Italian aesthetic of things. And I don't know, my family has been in Florence for a really long time. And it just, it felt like all these social pressures, like I couldn't really be myself. Uh, and especially for music, um, there's not really much going on in terms of film scoring and electronic music, or at least there wasn't when 
um, when I graduated high school in 2004. And I kind of just, when I was applying for colleges in the U.S., because I knew I wanted to come to the U.S. for college, I just kind of applied to Berkeley because I was like, well, this is where I secretly want to go. And I went and got, <laughs> and I was like, hey, guys, do you mind if I go to this music college? And my dad was kind of like, um, I guess if you then go and do law later. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, so I just I kind of left, I think, because I, I just needed, I'd been there all my life. I just needed to go and explore. But it's mm. it's always nice to go back. And I feel like now I appreciate the beauty of it more yeah. whereas like growing up in it all you know it just kind of ends up being like oh, here we go here come the tourists or like yeah. <laughs> oh like, here comes like the one movie that's filming here that's going to disrupt everything and you know like it just you end up kind of kind of having this love-hate relationship with it <laughs> um but it was really fun like as my brother calls the summertime it's fishing season because him and his guy friends would, like, essentially, like, go and, like, throw a hook and just, like, land on, like, 20 American girls. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, it was, you know, there's a lot of little fun things like that or, like, learning, just, you know, going out. And it's really safe there. So, it's, like, you start going out when you're a teenager and it's, like, you just build this relationship, I think, with, I don't know, with stuff. That's different. No, but That's fair. And actually, that's why I've always asserted that if I do ever move to Italy, I would be moving just outside of Florence, even mm -hmm. to Prato probably, because just like, then I don't have to be in the middle of the tourism. Kind yeah, because of, you know? it gets, I mean, last, we went to visit in May and it was, yeah, it was like year. out of control. Like literally like good thing that we knew the little side streets, because it's just like, and mm. then it gets so hot and people don't really believe in air conditioning there yet. And it's just like, <laughs> it's a little intense. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Ian, you grew up in Chicago. Yes. Who has the better pizza, Florence or Chicago? Ooh, that's so hard because they're so different. <laughs> I mean, I feel like so both Sophie and I are kind of like pizza snobs, but not like bad pizza snobs. We do, we love all pizza. Yeah. yeah. It's just we like we like the best of the all different types of pizza. But I mean, obviously Chicago is a better deep dish than Florence <laughs> does. But I don't know. I mean, all the food in Florence is incredible. You could have like. And just an apple off the street and it'll taste better than anything mm, you have here. Yeah. That's <laughs> and obviously pizza was very essential to your story. To yes. to the story of your <laughs> lives together. Yeah, and it continues to be. I uh I helped some friends open a pizza place in, in Brooklyn that I then worked at. Mm -hmm. So that's fantastic. That's, I feel like that that's what's propelled the like pizza snobbery <laughs> further. And then some um Maybe other it's not pizza snobs, it's just like pizza fanatics. Pizza fans. Maybe. We'll find an excuse to get pizza Avid at least pizza twice a fans. week. Yeah. We know pizza. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, uh, now, are you guys talking to me from your home for your studio? Are they both the same? What? They're one and the same. One We're in the uh, the converted garage studio right now. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. Which is where I mainly work. And so, do you? You don't both work in the same space, I'm guessing, because you see, you each kind of have your own ventures so this yeah, is I, sometimes we do but usually sophia has a studio set up in the front of the house mm. and i'm in the back here yeah. oh wonderful so that's uh that's pretty cool and mm -hmm. uh you <laughs> the th it seems that you like because you work together on some projects and you also work independently like how how does it how does it go when you work together in general it's, it's gone <laughs> like, how's that good. process kind of thing yeah, as we joke with everyone um, who, like, the moment we tell them that we work on something together, like, wow, you're so married, like, things are still okay. Like, you know, <laughs> we, we we kind of have found a way to work together. Um, and we, when we first met, we actually, we had, like, a little side project kind of band. Um, and we, I think, have just been able to work together because I feel like they're, all you need is kind of, like, mutual respect and not being afraid to show someone something that isn't perfect. And I feel like that was kind of like years in the making. So when it came to working on these these scores that Ian started doing and then the documentary we did, it just kind of felt like a natural progression of kind of being like, well, now we have to be like a little more understanding and a little more like patient with each other. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I feel like our, our process is, I mean, do you want to talk about? Yeah. <laughs> do you have ideas? I, it's definitely gotten better. Um, <laughs> Like, for instance, when we started first Monday in May, it was the first time where it was like, 
officially a co-score between the two of us because mm. a lot of the time Sophia has her drum and lace projects that I might help on a little bit, like playing guitar or something, but, you know, usually she's running the show. And the same goes for when I'm the composer on something, I'll have her sing or help with some ideas or mixing or yeah. just running everything by her just to get an opinion. Um, but I'm running the show in that instance. But for this one, it was really the two of us. And it took about, I don't know, three or four weeks of just kind of trying to sit in the same room and see if we could write together. A lot of yelling <laughs> <laughs> and maybe one or two door slams. And then like after the week was those weeks were over, we kind of got to the point where by the end of the film, we were sitting where we are now, the keyboards right here, yeah. like playing it at the same time, like writing together. Yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. Uh, but it just, it just took a little effort. <laughs> it was all. Yeah. And I feel like in a way we, we kind of complement each other because we come from different areas. Like Ian's very, as, as much as he's really good with like electronic production and since He's also really good at kind of like creating these lush um, orchestral sounds, which yeah. is very fitting considering like, you know, he does a lot more of like feature length and movies, whereas I feel like I come from more of like a shorter, more sample and beat based yeah. approach. So mm -hmm. a lot of the times if we work on something together, it'll be kind of like he'll start off fleshing out like maybe a chord progression and kind of like the sounds, the the, the meaty sounds. And I'll go in and like, pull up some samples or like come up with a beat and then maybe with a top line. And so it's just kind of mm. ends up working together. So. Yeah. My uh, one of my, one of my friends and I used to do that one like about 10 years ago, we used to actually exactly do that. Um, mm. It's funny because he was, he wasn't quite an instrumentalist, but he just think of like all these ideas and stuff. And he's like, dude, I got this idea. It's just like, Try yeah. this thing. And I'd, I'd try it and I'd, I'd lay down something else on it. And then he'd lay down like a little kind of bass idea or something like that. And it was really fun. It was a, nice. <laughs> a really fun process. Well, it's since. It's, it's, sorry? I was saying it's like building blocks. Yeah. It, oh, exactly. It's uh, musical Lego. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's incredible. On display next to me is a dress by Roberto Cavalli, whose colors and motifs pay obvious homage to Chinese blue and white porcelain. Fashion is about ideas, the way we live. You guys really have your work cut out. Our aim is to, to beat McQueen numbers. China through the looking glass, I think it's going to be inevitably controversial. There's going to be dissenters. But I'm not afraid of controversy, and I think shows should be controversial and provocative. Well, since since you mentioned it, well, let's uh, dig into it. So you co-composed the score to the first Monday in May, and it's it's, uh, it's basic to quote the official description. The film it's a documentary that follows the creation of a high-profile fashion exhibition at the Met, and it also tackles the question of whether fashion should be viewed as art. Uh, I'm guessing you, Sophia, have some very strong opinions on that. <laughs> yeah, actually, I mean, that was, it's, it, it's, it's been such an honor to be able to work on something like this, especially as somebody that's trying to work within a fashion context. Um, and I work with a lot of emerging designers and, um, and kind of trying to bring a little bit more of an art form back to um, fashion, whether it's through like fashion film or just kind of like supporting these emerging artists that don't have like a big platform to um, be exposed to to and you know that aren't fast fashion whatever so I feel like it the movie does a really good job at having kind of like the Anna Wintour side which is like the very like editorial and a little bit more commercial side of things and you know she's like this has this reputation of being this ice queen and she's like runs the biggest fashion magazine in the world so there was that and like to her like it kind of like the Vogue perspective of like yeah sure fashion is art but fashion is also a business yeah, yeah. and then counteracting with Andrew Bolton, who is one of my favorite people now. He's, oh my God. <laughs> anyway. Um, How many photos he, have you posted of him in the past week? Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> and he's married to Tom, or his partner is Tom Brown. I mean, how much better does it get? Anyway, um, and Our so couple. he kind of, he comes in from the artistic side because he's now the head curator of the Costume Institute. And for him, just kind of through the documentary, you see the way that he looks at these garments and it's like he's looking at a piece of art and it's he's like digging deeper into like w the context and like where is this coming from and like historically what came before it, what's going to come after it. And 
So it really, I mean, I already consider fashion as art just mm. because so much, so much of history can be seen through clothes. So I feel like there's not really a separation between yeah. history yeah. and fashion and art. Um, but this movie, I think, does a really good job at kind of like following him and his his path to figuring out how this exhibit works into the fashion and art mm-hmm. thing. No. I don't know. That's good. <laughs> that's well, better well, not to say it. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you guys get involved in the first place um, with the project? This was my third time working with Andrew Rossi, the director. Um, he gave me my first uh, documentary feature job, which was Ivory Tower, a few years ago. Yeah. And then he brought me back for the HBO doc, Thought Crimes, about the Cannibal Cop, because um, he was producing it. So I think it was at the premiere for Cannibal Cop, which is Trebekah last year, actually. Yeah. He said, I have something new coming. Uh, it's actually about fashion, so it would be cool if maybe Sophie could help you with it, because he knew that Sophie was working with Drum and Lace. Um, I was like, yeah, sure. Like We haven't done something together like that in a while. It could be fun. Um, so it, it was actually, you know, Andrew was bringing me back for repeat business, but then he actually had the initial idea of Sophia should be a part of this. Nice. Mm-hmm. And what kind of That's- score did you guys end up coming up with? <laughs> uh it's definitely varied um <laughs> it's a mixture of chamber orchestra uh ambient and analog synths uh some kind of like more indie guitar sound some electro pop it's it's a melting pot of a lot of different genres yeah because i mean as all documentaries do it's kind of like a mix of kind of backstory and some flashbacks and kind of like stuff like that that needed its own sonic environment and then there's like the contemporary kind of like you know we're we're building the exhibit kind of like the the core music and then there's you know there's still kind of like the cheeky element of like well we're putting on this like gala which yeah. you know it's like on a scale of you know, you know which at the end of the day is, is for a good cause you know for the met but it's quite frivolous you know so there's like yeah. a little bit like the music had to kind of reflect that or like <laughs> silly you know silly moments that they like re- you know yeah. so it's definitely a lot of music i think we did a good job of i i know i am like a very thematic based writer like all of my scores it may not be like a john williams theme but like there's something in there that's a continuous thread throughout everything else that happens in the score that i try to keep up keep going yeah. And I think we did a good job of, like, even though we jump from genre to genre to genre, it still sounds like it came from the same place musically. Yeah. Uh, at least I hope, I hope we did. <laughs> that, was, that was the goal, basically. It's like, I know we're going to write stuff that, like, might sound it came from a rock record or an mm-hmm. orchestral album or, like, all these different things. But if at the end of the day we can listen to it all the way through and it sounds like it flows together and came from the same place, then I think we'll have done our job right, which... I'm hoping that that's what happens. <laughs> that's yeah. awesome. Will, will there be a soundtrack album coming out with it? Yeah, we we're working on it. We'd love to get this one out there. We're really proud of it. Yeah, um, and I think it's a good hour and a half, nearly an hour and a half of music. Yeah, we wrote a lot of music for it. Yeah, um, so I think we ended up writing maybe close to two hours, if not over two hours. I mean, obviously, not all of it was used, but yeah, but a lot of music for this one. That's right. Mm-hmm. Well, if not all of it was used, do you do you see, do you use some of the cues that you? that kind of didn't get used, do you get to use it for other stuff, for other purposes? <laughs> um, it depends on the project. Like, some projects are all-inclusive, so whatever you write kind of belongs to mm. the project. Yeah. Depends. Yeah, nice. I, I'm not sure in this case, but we, we haven't thought that far yet. Yeah. I think we're, we're trying to figure out if we can release the score. Oh, okay. I, think, I think anything mm-hmm. that wasn't used in the film wasn't that amazing anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> no harm, no foul. Yeah. Uh, no, well, it's also it's also a, pers- uh, a matter of taste, really, as well. Like, it's not just oh, you know, it wasn't good, therefore I'm not going to use it. It's like uh, it didn't work for me for that for that thing. So, right. yeah. uh, and you you described your process as at the by the end of it, you were sitting at the keyboard together writing stuff, and like mm-hmm. before. Um, so this is the first time you've really actually written a score together. Yeah, like mm-hmm. fully from top to bottom. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's... I think that for the other projects, I've either written something separately and then brought it in and yeah. Ian's yeah. Like mixed it or like produced it more, or then I've just kind of like contributed vocals mm-hmm. or little things here and there. But it's the first time that we actually like sat down and 
were like co really co scoring the way yeah. that we. So that was that was that the case for Silicon Cowboys? Um, because you, you, Sophia, are accredited with additional music, uh, whereas you, Ian, are accredited as the composer. So, uh, what was the deal there? Uh, I always lead composer on that one, um, and most of that score is me and my sense, just kind of like doing yeah. that. But uh, <laughs> Sophia, I think she had like three or four cues that are fully her that I might have just like minor tweaks on to make it fit with the rest of the score, but they were just fully her pieces of music that. Uh, it was a quick job. Like, I think I got the call second or third week of January um, that they needed someone to do it because I guess whoever was on board before just wasn't working out. Oh, wow. But also, trying to finish, uh, it was finished a week before it premiered, basically. Yikes. Uh, and then uh, we also had a, a trip to Paris planned in the middle of that that wasn't really going to be able to be moved around. So I think I did the whole score in about four or five weeks. Um, and again, it was another like you know hour of music or so. It's like all synth based. Yeah. But there was a few scenes that like I knew Sophie would be able to handle so well, and she pulled it off amazingly. That's awesome. <laughs> 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 and so this is uh, Silicon Cowboys premiere at South by Southwest, and uh, it's a documentary about the rise and fall of compact uh, computers. Actually, my dad's first laptop in the late '90s was a compact. Remember this, like, this this thick little box and he'd bring it home yeah. and I'd be like, let me play some some like NHL hockey on it or something. Mm -hmm. uh, like it was just so, so like I just used to play games whenever I was like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so like was, was the subject matter of like, you know, computers and Silicon Cowboys and that kind of thing, was that the impetus behind the, you know, all your uh, electronic fun? Yeah, I, it definitely added to it. Um, I mean, the whole, it's funny because everyone hears a name and they immediately think it's about a bunch of like Silicon bigwigs, <laughs> but it's actually the three founders are just like three good old boys from Texas, from Houston. Yeah. That were like, hey, we should, we're bored with our jobs. Let's try starting a company. Well, they worked at Texas Instruments. Yeah, they worked at Texas Instruments. So they had oh. a computer background, but uh, they, they didn't want to do it. They felt the corporate environment was weird and they wanted to do something that they were proud of, basically. Um, so that's why, hence the Cowboys in the title. But anyways, um, I think a lot of it had to do with the, uh, what the story centers around, where the story takes place, because it's all through early 80s to the very end of the decade. Um, and then there was also some conversations I had with the director, Jason Cohen, who was kind of pushing towards that type of sound. Um, but they really, once I, started on it they really just kind of let me go wild with it so i appreciate for them letting me do that because i had a lot of fun with it that well what was the most interesting kind of aspect or adventure that you got to have with the film um there were a few moments where you know there there is it's not a it's not like a serious documentary but there are a few moments where you know there there is some drama that happens there is some evolution of characters there's stuff that happens in the story that you really have to hit right um and you know even though i'm living in this world of a million sounds at my fingertips it was still it, it's hard to make sure you find the right thing there mm. that it can actually work and you know a lot of the score a lot of the cues were kind of stemming from sequences that i was running in my sense which works great when you kind of have like a fun dancey or upbeat thing but for these like sadder moments that I have to hit, it took me a while to find the right thing that isn't going to sound like a tro total cheese ball moment in the score. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I had a few moments like that where I, I still wanted to, you know, do a good job with the score and not take people out of the story, but I think it worked out. Yeah, it's hard to find an ARP that doesn't sound happy, but then doesn't sound like a death march either. So yeah. Like... yeah, it's you have to find that middle ground, which is really tricky. Yeah. yeah. That fair point. And it kind of sounds like you followed a similar process to, to Junkie Excel and Deadpool. Because he was like using all these like vintage synths and stuff for the score. That is like, he was using synths for the sadder moments as well. Like, it's like, here's, yeah. here's a bunch of warm pads and uh, yeah. that kind of they, thing. They really lend themselves well to a lot of different types of emotions. <laughs> I would and, love to go to Junkie Excel's castle of synths. Oh, too. yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> well, what about Hans Zimmer's like wall of synths? Yeah. I don't know. I, I'm seeing photos of Junkie's studio lately. I think he's giving Hans a run for his money. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I should see the video where he talks about all the synths he did, he yeah, did for exactly. Deadpool. It's, 
phenomenal. I sat there like I watched it twice, and I'm like, my god, this is amazing. It's like, yeah. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, I'm sitting here with like a little slim fatty. Just yeah, this, is, thought, like, this yeah. is all I got <laughs> as as far as hardware synths go. Well, I with those though. They're great. Yeah, I know, right? They're fantastic. <laughs> uh, and you guys, so you guys both seem to have this love and affinity for electronics, like. Mm -hmm. Is it one more than the other, or is it like that you both just... How did that happen? How did that kind of come about? I, I don't... I think we were both were already into the type of thing when we met, you know? Like, I think we listened to a lot of the same music when we were growing up. Um, Bonded over Radiohead. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, 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 nice. I was just going to say, like, I think listening to so much Radiohead really kind of pushed me onto it. Mm -hmm. uh, but honestly, like, almost any music that I listen to always features some sort of electronic element in it um even if it's like a band like wilco which is one of my favorite bands like it's a alt rock country band but they have synths in there that they're always mm -hmm. hiding in the background and yeah fitting yeah. into songs that you wouldn't think they'd be able to yeah and i mean i grew up going clubbing <laughs> so i feel like in a way that kind of like the the feeling of kind of like the the beats and the the kind of the progression of what electronic even if it's like that's less like experimental the more commercial electronic yeah. aspect it's just really helped um you know to be able to do stuff because then you kind of like you dig a little bit deeper and then you get into things that are like a little bit more you know you're like all of a sudden you fall onto bjork and then you're like wait a minute and you're like <laughs> oh my god and then it's you know and then you go to like radiohead as you're like bjork light and then you like go into like the top 20 so it's it's kind of like I think it's been an ongoing love affair. Um, and then Ian, I mean, obviously, once he started playing in Passion Fit, it was like... Yeah, that really... Because I had always had an interest, but I was never really like a keyboard player, and I never really had much experience with synths, but the band definitely was like a full-on master course in dealing oh, with Well, what's funny is that at the time when they started playing, people were like, oh, we're so tired of guitars, and now people are like, oh, we're so tired of synths, we want real <laughs> instruments again. And it's yeah. like, well, people... <laughs> Get be happy with whatever you got. <laughs> yeah. Oh lord, that's that's hilarious. <laughs> well, um, you you spent seven years in Passion Pit, Ian, uh, mm -hmm. work with them, and before you before you made the transition to full time film scoring, and you know there's, there's quite a few composers who did that, like you know Hans Zimmer and Danny Elfman did that. Except now they've had longer film careers than they've had band careers. Uh, yeah. You had other people more recently, like Tom Salta and Tree Adams, uh, and it seems like you know. It seems like starting over, but it's not really starting over when you, you know, move into film composing. Uh, because, you know, you've got a lot of experience behind you and whatever you learned in, in the band kind of environment, you can bring into the film scoring environment. What did making that transition feel like for you? Uh, it was really, really scary to do, honestly. Um, I, I definitely got to a point where I knew that I didn't want to continue touring with the band, but, and, and I knew that I did want to dive into scoring, but at the same time, it was a little bit of a safety blanket for a number of reasons. Um, but yeah, it was kind of like a leap of faith, just being like, I know this is what I want to do. I think I can do an okay job at it. I have to at least give it a shot. And if it doesn't work, uh, I don't know, I'll work at a coffee shop or something. But. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it was tricky because it, it, it is starting over very much so, especially because, you know, even though it's still like an entertainment industry, there's a music world and there's a film world mm -hmm. and they very much yeah. are different things. Um, and it was also a little peculiar for me because I wasn't the front man of the band. Uh, I was never the main songwriter in the band. Um, I was just a key player from for seven years in it. Uh, but you know, once you step outside of that being like, I'm not of this entity anymore, you're just on your own. Uh, yeah. And you know, some people will be like, oh, you're in that band, that's cool, I know them, like, I trust you to do something for me. But not everyone knows all the bands in the world, and many people are just like, as far as I know, you're just some kid off the street. Uh, so it's definitely, I've, I've felt that the past three or four years that I've been doing this has definitely been like a slow crawl back up <laughs> to the point where, you know, I'm standing on my own two feet. And I think I'm, I think I'm there. I think this year's going well so far. <laughs> That's I think by the end of it, I'll be able to kind of like stand on my own and cut that tie basically. But yeah, uh, yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's hard. It's not easy to do, especially because scoring is, I, I get asked so often by 
friends that are musicians that play in bands are like getting to that point where it's like, I can't be on the road anymore. I'm so tired. You know, I, any money that I make on touring just gets spent the second I go home. Like it's impossible to save anything, so on and so on. Uh, I want to try scoring. How is it? And it's just like, I, I think everyone should try it because it's so much fun, but it really is a lot of work. Oh, yeah. Like oh. it is not an easy job to do. Um, especially if you want to do it well and you want to turn it into a career, like you really have to put a lot into it. Mm -hmm. Uh, endless hours of time to go into it. Well, and we've been, we, we were talking about how over the holiday season, we were getting a lot of kind of right out of college, um, guys and gals emailing both of us being like, hi, I'm like a fan of your music for like both of us, like would love to meet up and, you know, I'm trying to do what you guys are doing. And, it's always so nice to like see what like you know the the young a uh, young, slightly younger generation wants to do but it's like it's hard it's hard to tell them how hard the hustle of like doing this and making music your full-time career is without disheartening them yeah cuz you know yeah. it's like it's it is really hard and there's days when things are great and then there's days when things are really bad and you know like you get maybe half like if you're lucky of the pro projects you get put up for and then it's like less less and then <laughs> like less. and then you have to just kind of like pick yourself up all the time and i feel like thankfully we have each other cuz i feel like that also helps but yeah strong strong support network over here yeah, I was, yeah. well I, I, I was gonna say that that it's you're in a very kind of interesting you're an interesting kind of creative couple because you're both in the same industry in this in a way and mm -hmm. Uh, but you also kind of work it separately as well. So you have your own things going on, but you also work. To, you can work together, and so obviously that you under you completely understand. I'd imagine that you completely understand the nature of the job. So you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't imagine that one of you is like, "Come to bed. It's four a.m. Why are you still in the studio?" That's because probably you're yelling that from your own studio. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. It's like, do you love the studio more than me? Yeah. <laughs> Do you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he could ask you the same question. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Like, well, um, because since we're speaking about like you know individual paths, drum and lace, that's a mm -hmm. very unique venture, Sophia, and it's I literally know no one else who is doing what you're doing, and where you so you compose uh, music specifically for fashion campaigns and presentations, and mm -hmm. and uh, like. I like I've I've read a few interviews where you've spoken about that, but like you know I don't think maybe our audience ha hasn't quite seen that before. So what would you tell an audience that completely doesn't know what you're doing? Um, well, essentially I um, do custom compositions for um, emerging designers and established designers um, in fashion and beauty industries that want music um, composed or licensed for. Uh, their lookbook videos, their runway shows, their fashion presentations. Um, I've recently been putting together like curated playlists. Um, just kind of working within like, I hate to say like, give people, essentially I'm trying to like work with designers to kind of enhance their artistic vision, but like by adding music to it. Yeah. And I yeah. feel like now with the rise of fashion film and with online content, there's like a real space to be able for and you know the accessibility of making videos like of creating more content that kind of if you're a designer shows the way the clothes move um and brings it to life instead of being on a page in a magazine kind of being able to make the brand a little bit more immersive in a way um and honestly it just it just started because um having had somebody that played in a band that constantly got asked for licensing I knew yeah. how expensive it is to license a band's track. And if you're an emerging designer, you don't have that kind of budget. But then at the same time, you don't necessarily want them to have to like go to like YouTube royalty free music or like go to kind of like a big music licensing company that has like, you know, keywords like funny and quirky and whatever. <laughs> so it was kind of like giving people a, a slightly more artistic, um, a more artistic option. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I work one-on-one -on -one with designers and it's all kind of fed off of like um, the textures and the colors of and mood boards and kind of, I feel like my love of fashion is nearly as big as my love of music. So I kind of like, it's easy for me to couple or understand like, 
oh, your collection is all like jacquard or it's all silk. Okay, like I understand what that would sound like because I would wear it and I feel like, so that's that's kind of where it came from. That's amazing. Perhaps. Yeah, <laughs> and I mean, there's a few people that do like, there's some people that are more like on the DJ side of things that do music for runway. Yeah. Um, but not many people that do like specifically like music for lookbooks. And you know, a lot of the time people get like musicians get called to do it or you know, it's it's I feel like everyone's got a friend who's a musician. So a lot of times like that's how things happen, but I'm really trying to kind of do this for emerging designers. Um, but, I yeah. see. Um, yeah. I, now I'm I feel so ignorant because I don't know what a lookbook is. Uh, a lookbook is um, essentially when a designer um, makes a present, makes a collection, uh, whether it's like a winter or a spring collection, yeah. they create a lookbook which has all of the clothes modeled by a mm -hmm. model or, you know, like posed so that they can uh, give it to, to buyers and to stylists so they, oh, then okay, they can yeah. buy, buy for their stores and whatever. But um, the lookbook has kind of become a way to show the, the coming season. Um, mm. in video format and I feel like it's it's kind of this like big triumph of like film realizing like hey like fashion is art and it's beautiful and let's like make a moving narrative or image of these beautiful clothes that you just spent all of your like sweat blood and tears into making because like sure. I mean being a designer is really hard like I don't think I really even realized when I started drum and lace it's like you have to source the materials you have to design it you have to produce it and then you do all of this without anyone paying you anything and then you hope that they're gonna yeah. pick up your <laughs> you know it's just like and and it's if it's one person it's it's expensive and it's exhausting and so any help that i can give musically <laughs> but isn't that the, isn't that sometimes the case as a composer where it's in some in some ways you're pitching and you're just like doing your own thing you still don't get paid and then you might may or may not get the job all mm -hmm. by yourself so it's yeah. like I'd, I'd imagine you understand how the designers feel like firsthand then. Yeah, and I mean you too, like with, I see you have equipment, it's like that in a way is putting yourself kind of in the hole because like you're yeah, hoping that yeah. then you'll get to use it, but that in, nobody's paying for you to like buy your synths, you know, right. so it's, <laughs> an initial investment is like, that's a little bit of a leap of faith oh, on your credit Lord. card. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That and I've even got a got a slave computer down uh, down on this side, so it's just like. Uh, <laughs> just, oh, <man. laughs> yeah. and, and so it's kind of like what you're doing is working somewhere between scoring short films and scoring commercials. It's the it's like this. It's a really interesting middle ground. Yeah, and, it's it still has the commercial aspect because a lot of them tend to then kind of they're they're for a commercial reason, but at the same time it's kind of like really trying to like make mini films yeah. um and i mean ian and i do um we compose for kind of like commercials for like big agencies on the side yeah but this is yeah. kind of like a little bit more of like a art i, I like to think of it more of like a little bit more artistic mm. of an expression it's more bespoke <laughs> yeah it's more exactly i yeah, yeah. i really don't like that that word but, <laughs> oh really <laughs> yeah i think like it's been abused in the fashion context for oh, the past it's Interesting. like I'm a bespoke thing, and you're like, oh my god, just go away. Oh, <laughs> because <laughs> I've only ever really heard it used in the music, uh, like in the music side, or like you know, yeah. oh, you know, you have a bespoke score to uh, for a film rather than licensing yeah. or rather than. Yeah, in mu you know what, in music it's fine, but in fashion I'm like, just just call it like original or custom. Like it's funny because it bothers me more for music than it does for fashion. Really? Because it's like, <laughs> so you had your your film score. It's not like a best. Well, score, it's just like you hired a composer and he wrote music. Yeah. Right? I mean, it just means custom, right? Yeah, or I mean four. So Christopher Nolan's like, I had a bespoke score done for Interstellar. It just sounds <laughs> uh, Well, I suppose it, it would work in a context where where it wasn't that case. Like, when Spitfire Audio started, they they didn't do commercial libraries, they did bespoke libraries for composers, like, they had a very small uh, client true. pool. So I think that's, maybe that's the difference, I don't know. That, 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 like, that, that makes sense. That's better. Yeah, or like, <laughs> bespoke just is kind of like, oh, if you want a bespoke dress for an event, like, mm. that, I guess that makes sense, but then it's like, if you call yourself a 
I mean, just call yourself like a costume designer or designer. I mean, that's what you do. I on a side note, I realized in the course of this conversation that you guys look like J.J. Abrams and Anne Hathaway in a, in a way, like. Whoa! Well, we you just made my day. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I get Anne Hathaway sometimes, and Ashley Judd. But then half of the people that I say that they people tell me Ashley Judd, the other half are like who? So. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's what it's it's like you know like you you these like uh, mini versions of them. It's amazing. <laughs> Yeah. It's really funny. <laughs> made this day. Sure. <laughs> so that means now you're, you're going to go into into directing film as well, aren't you? Because J.J. Abrams is also a composer. That not a lot of people know that. I, I know that. He composed the theme for Lost, supposedly. And for yeah. Fringe. So and, and, for, and for Alias. And oh, for Alias. Yeah, yeah. And an, the other show that we watched that sounds exactly like Fringe. Oh, what show is that? Is it um, the one with Matt Dillon? Oh, Wayward Pines. Wayward Pines. I don't Wayward. think he wrote that, but it sounds it sounds like it. Yeah. He was probably the he was probably the temp. Yeah. 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 No, exactly. Temp, temp with his own music. Do you do you deal do you deal with a lot of temp love that you have to battle against? Yes. Especially, I, definitely in her world, and mm-hmm. then especially in the documentary world, like mm. it, it can be brutal at times. Yeah. Uh, part of the reason why. First Monday in May is such an eclectic mix is because there is a lot of temp love happening. Oh, um, wow. It's, I mean, I, I see it from the, both sides, so I understand why it has to happen. Like, for them, the editors that I work with a lot, they just edit so much better if they have music to lay it to. Yeah. Uh, but for us, we write so much better if we have picture to lay it to. Uh, and it's just like, it's hard to find a way for those to work at the same time. Uh, it's just like one person has to start before the other. Yeah. Uh, and I feel like it's it's something that I'm continually working on where I can just write without picture. Uh, but I just, I feel like my stronger material doesn't come until I, I'm looking at something. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, there was a lot of different things happening on First Monday in May and many other films we've worked on where we've kind of had to fight that a little bit. Yeah, mm-hmm. and for me, usually I come in because they realize that they can't license a song, and then they're like, <laughs> yeah. well, we want it to sound exactly like this. So I've had mm-hmm. anything from people be like, hey, so I love Give Me Shelter by the Rolling Stones. Can you do something that sounds really similar? I'm like, sure. Do you want me to cover the White Album, too, while I'm at it? Like, <laughs> but it's that, or like the, the thing that I get the most is kind of um, the the very like psychedelic 70s sound. Like, there's this one band... Um, if you're listening, <laughs> um, they get they get tempt or like they are the inspiration for so many of like the every videos. LA every LA designer, because it's like the kind of music that you would hear like perfectly with kind of like a sexy girl in Joshua Tree, kind of in the desert. It's like yeah. Bohemian, so and, um, rock. and that, and then I mean, we get it all the time. They're like, yeah, we don't want to sound alike, but like as close as you can to this, and it's. Just, <laughs> It's it's great because they're giving you direction, but then it's also disheartening because you feel like compelled to have to stick within something. But I don't know. It helps and it can it can be very helpful, but it can also be very detrimental. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, exactly man. right. Yeah. Well, to segue, was there a lot of Templar in my blind brother? Uh, very very little. Awesome. Uh, that that film is very music light. Uh, I think this the whole score is about. 25 minutes or so of music oh, um cool. and you know it was it was my first like real comedy that i've worked on um I've, I've, every film i worked on has like little comedic moments but this was like a full-on comedy and so it was a little interesting to like really have music come in when it needs to get out right away yeah. uh, and just kind of have like little spurts of shining moments or as opposed <laughs> to like you know the documentary we had just done and a few other things where it's like long developing cues yeah um, which is kind of a little more how I think. Like, the shorter you make something, the harder it is for me to like, get the idea across right away. Um, there, there was like maybe one or two conversations where I was like, but I really like how this stock piece of commercial music does this. Can you do that? Uh, but for the most part, they kind of let me develop my sound for that. Um, oh, that's awesome. Which was, it was a nice change from the other scores because this one was full guitar. That's uh, awesome. <laughs> I, there's a lot, a lot of guitars. Um, and it, it's, it's very much towards kind of like that indie film score sound you people are familiar with but it, it was so fun to do it because i don't do it very often 
And there's some interesting string work happening there as well. Yeah, I I really wanted to fit some players into that one as much as I could. Um, Cause it's not, again, like they, it is such little like kind of sweeter cues that like overdoing them too much with a big orchestra would just be silly. Yeah. But I was able to fit uh, about a quartet in there, I think. Um, I just actually recorded them here. But, oh, like, one fantastic. Of so, like, oh, you overdubbed, okay. <laughs> and I would just compile all together, which is not how I would love to do it, but it's how I had to do it for this one. Nice. Um, yeah, but it, it's nice to, as the story goes on, it kind of gets a little bigger with the, the sections. Mm. Nice, and uh, <laughs> well, my, my girlfriend and I are very huge fans of Parks and Rec, so it's pretty awesome to see two, two of the cast members, Jenny Slate and Adam Scott, Three. star it. Three? Who else? Nick Kroll is the douche. The, the radio DJ. Oh my God! Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't, I, cause like I didn't actually like see see the picture properly, so I didn't actually connect the name to the. There you go. Three of them. That's fantastic. Do you get yeah. a lot of the same flavor in a sense, or? Um, a little bit. <laughs> I don't know. It's. I mean, it's. It kind of could come from the same world as Parks and Rec. I like yeah. the story. Yeah. Sorry, I mean, but uh, yeah, it's a little different. It's not <laughs> as like um. I feel like Parks and Rec is very kind of patriotic that theme. <laughs> yeah, it's like Leslie Nope is just like Leslie Nope for president. <laughs> it's definitely a different story. But uh yeah. You know, it's that same kind of like really dry comedy that mm. like you when you pay attention to it, it's like so hilarious. Yeah. Um I we that also premiered at South by and the screening went really, really well. Fair there was enough. there was a woman laughing so hard in the back I thought she was gonna joke. <laughs> <laughs> well I'll that's all three of the actors are playing roles that they don't usually play too, which oh, that's yeah, brilliant. they're super different. Um, which I think is cool. Like if anyone comes to it as a Parks and Rec fan, you're like, oh wow, these guys are really great actors because they can really do differently. Um, there was actually, uh, I, don't, I don't know if he was 100% blind, but there was a visually impaired person in the audience who stood up and said that Adam Scott's portrayal of a blind person was one of the most like subtle and on point portrayals he's seen in a long time that's fantastic um, which i don't know if any of us were expecting to hear that but it was pretty <laughs> amazing to hear well i i read a review about uh, about the film just from from south by southwest uh mm -hmm. it says that like sophia goodhart who's the writer and director has mm -hmm. an ability to merge rudeness and sweetness without ever stumbling into cruelty or sentimentality uh yeah. So it's a very interesting observation, and the way uh, the way you say that his portrayal is kind of uh, subtle and not overplayed or anything uh, is, th is that kind of what you felt working on the film? Uh, is that this is what came across? That was that was the goal that we were trying to achieve, and that, it was actually really difficult for me at first because I kept turning people into villains, um, and I, I shouldn't have, but like I just kept seeing that in my head. Yeah. Um, so it took a little while to find the right tone for them that wasn't going to vilify anyone wasn't going to turn anyone to a straight up hero because the the way the film, the only way it would work is if everyone came at, to it from like an equal playing field, basically. Yeah, and that's yeah. when they start, you know, trying to fight each other. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it. We pull it off in the end, but it is definitely that was the biggest goal of the whole film was to like not overtly go one way or the other. Well, there you go. And so obviously that affected your choices in the score and mm -hmm. uh... How did you get involved uh, working on it? Uh, this was purely through my, my agent brought it to me and awesome. luckily it worked out, which is very rare. It doesn't happen very often, but uh, I was really lucky. I got to read the script uh, right as soon as he brought it to me and the script was incredible. Yeah. I and mean, it was yeah. really, really strong. I was laughing out loud. Uh, <laughs> and and then when I heard he was attached to it too, I was just like, please, <laughs> please give me this job. <laughs> I want to score these people. <laughs> well, that's awesome. And Sophia, you sang on it as well. I did. Um, yeah. Not, not, not too, too much. It's though. a quick cue, but she's on there. Yeah, I think that, and then just kind of being general uh, cheerleader and assistant, and <laughs> I think extra set of ears. Almost every score I do, I have Sophia's music assistant because yeah. I have to ask her a thousand questions a day of like, is this okay? Is this okay? Is this okay? Oh my god, it's <laughs> to the point that I get completely. I get cornered, like we sit in the car and all of a sudden the cue's playing and I'm like, damn it! <laughs> and he's like, what do you think of it? And I'm like, oh, I can't even leave the room because we're not driving. Um, you know, the joy of having Dropbox on every device. So it's right. just like, we'll be sitting like about to watch a TV show and he's like, oh, hold on. And I think he's like pulling up a trailer and it's like his 
the cue that he just bounced while I was like badgering him to come watch TV, and I was just like, oh. so. uh -huh. <laughs> opinion. I don't know. <laughs> Well, that's that's uh, well. That brings me to a question of balance. How do you, how do you guys play with balance in terms of uh, being that both of you work work yeah. in in this creative field and very similar jobs and or di similar similar industry or, or different aspects in the same job kind of thing? How do you kind of keep yourself sane? I suppose. Uh, we try and take time off whenever we can, uh, which sometimes will be like. A Tuesday through a Wednesday, even though everyone else is at work. Um, which you know, usually if we're if I'm on a film and she's on one or two of her projects, like we can take weekdays off because we're not necessarily on like a nine to five schedule. Yeah. Um, yeah. That has helped us a lot, especially because hotels or wherever we go will be empty. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, if we don't have time, like we'll just try to go out and do hikes and get out of the house as much as we can, because otherwise, like we would never ever leave the house. Since we're both working from home. Yeah. And I feel like we're just both understanding of our schedules. It's like I just know that one week is going to be really crazy for him. So it's just kind of like kind of try to like leave him alone and just let him work and, you know, just figure it out. And then there's been times when it's been that for me. And it's just it's just a matter of like knowing that it's it's not forever and that he just this is what we have to do to do what we what we want. When I, guess. I, when I was touring with the band, it was really difficult because I was yeah. always gone. Yeah. And there was like, we can never go anywhere because I'm always, always gone. And now it's like, I always have to be home. I, I can't leave <laughs> my desk. I have to but be But at least writing. he's here. So. Yeah. Now I'm just around all the time. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's fantastic. All right. Well, last little question. What's in your studio? What's what, like, so we're currently in Ian's studio. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what's wow. in your studio? And, and suppose, Sophia, what's in yours? I've seen videos of yours at your studio as well. So, um, like, oh, yeah. I have a fair idea. Um, well, oh, what do you this. like? What's your favorite kind of... Let's see if I can move this a little bit. Oh, my goodness. So, oh. there's a sense here. There's Prophet 6, Mellotron, Sub-37, Juno 106, Prophet 12. There's a mini brew back there. Oh, there's really? a couple more on the shelf back there, and there's also guitars behind Sophia. <laughs> um, yeah, several guitars. Yeah, here yeah, is the Dave Smith OB6 I just got. Lovely. Uh, and there's some amps here, and then I have a outboard rack here. I don't have a ton of outboard stuff, but I have a few pieces that I I try to use as often as I can. Um, I really like uh, Gregory Scott's company, uh, Kush Audio. Yeah. He makes some compressors and equalizers that I think are incredible. Awesome. And yeah. what, about, what about you, Sophia? Um, I mean, I feel like so the my office is also our second bedroom. So I feel like it always has to kind of stay. It can never become kind of my little cave because it needs to look presentable whenever we have guests. Uh, okay. um, but so I tend to have smaller things like I now there's a um, Ableton push. Um, I have like OP1. a OP1, um, a Volca beat a glockenspiel um and then i mean i have my like my native instruments keyboard and that part of it if it ever shows up yeah i uh i have this like kickstarter campaign thing that i got that's been in production since last august and it's like it's this polyphonic um synthesizer called the parva yeah and um it's only gonna have two voices because that's all i could that's all i could pledge on kickstarter yeah. <laughs> But, you know, at least it is polyphonic. It's not just monophonic. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, the thing is that if I ever need a synth, I'll come in here and it's just easy to just, like, plug in and just kind of, like, play. I'll bounce something out from my system and just, like, play it on here and then um, use this. And I have two small little Genelec speakers that I use. But then the before I send off anything big, just we'll come in here and we'll listen to it and mm -hmm. stare, like, on the two different speakers and... Um, on headphones um, a lot of the times I'll do like the iPhone test or the laptop test because you know that like a lot Those of people are important. yeah because you know that like half of the people you're sending stuff to are going to be listening on just like normal app like laptop speakers so you want it to like sound good everywhere mm, yeah um but I feel like most of the gear is is in here yeah it's 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 a mess in here <laughs> and honestly, like, a lot of the other stuff I mean a lot of times I'll just record I'll use like a um, zoom h4n and I'll just like record 
something and then I'll sample it or I'll use mm. my phone. So then yeah. that. She does a lot of amazing sound design with an Ableton. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's fantastic. So, she, yeah. she, I'm jealous. She's able to keep everything very nice and neat. We're in here. It's just like distraction, <laughs> distraction, distraction. <laughs> but, you know, we justify it as in like, I'll go out and buy like a vintage jacket and he'll buy a synthesizer. And it's just like, well, <laughs> I guess that's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> No, that's amazing and i've heard uh, and i've had a good listen to both of your music and like sophia your your music's is incredible ian your music is incredible and it's just like like and they're so different it's not like it's like well we're just both doing the same thing we're just clones of each other no each like you have very individual personalities which is uh which comes through and uh you know well, I, I look forward to hearing the uh the full score for uh first mundane mate see both of these come together see what that sounds like you know, I think oh, it's yeah. a really good mix <laughs> of the two things. I think you I can think so probably too. hear the both of us. And I think that's also why we, I, I think that that's why there's no like jealousy between us. Cause we do, we want, we want different things and our sounds are different. So we get hired, even on commercials, we get hired for different things. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's, yeah. we're never stepping on each other's toes. And I feel like that really, that really helps. You've never yeah. tried to, you've never pitched for the same job. We haven't yet. No, we if, haven't. If, if there's something that like we both are approached about, we'll just, do like a co co write. Yeah, I don't think there's any reason for me to be like, well, I just want to do it on my own. Yeah, I <laughs> hope you wouldn't. Either. Unless one of us is in a really bad mood or something. Yeah. <laughs> Poor pizza. <laughs> you ate the last slice. That's it. It's me or nothing. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, Ian, and Sophia, thank you so much for for chilling out with me today and uh, you know just opening up your home and your heart uh, to our audience and. Uh, it's been a pleasure getting to getting to know you and uh, uh, speaking to you guys. You too. Thank Thanks you. so much. Yeah. Thank you. Great.